Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Welcome back. It's another edition of Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. Today we're talking with the uh, the Dean of uh, Canadian, uh, I'll say, arts and entertainment uh, critic commentator. It's uh, Max Wyman from uh, the West Coast, West Vancouver area, Lions Bay, I think. So, uh, Max Wyman, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Dennis, it's a pleasure. It really is. And we're here. I'm not so sure. <laughs> and uh, we're here to talk about uh, Max's latest work. It's called The Compassionate Imagination, How the Arts Are Central to a Functioning Democracy. So I guess right off the bat there, sir, uh, why this book and why now? Well, you know, I've spent my life working in the arts in, in Canada. I've been a writer, critic, uh, I was on the board of the Canada Council for a while. I've helped to make things happen in terms of uh, cultural policy. And I think it's time for us to really get serious about how we embrace the arts and culture as part of the way we live together. Uh, the, the, the argument in my book is that if we, as a society, Canada as a whole, places the arts uh, and culture at the center of the way we live together, we can find a way to develop the kind of compassionate, harmonious, understanding society that will get us out of the mess we're in. We're in a terrible mess. We, we are, you know, we're at the end of the world as we know it. You know, the public square is, is a really polarized place these days. It's full of insults and, and grievances. and. You know, mutual trust that we used to have has just evaporated. And we shout, and we should be listening. And it's time to, to bring that anger down, to, to get back to that middle ground, that, that Canadian middle ground, if you like, of, of generosity and, and, and shared humanity, and where we can come together and imagine a, a, a better, a more inclusive society, a, a society that works for everybody. And uh, we're talking about uh, the compassionate imagination, but uh, whose imagination? Uh, individual imagination or collective? Yeah, imagination? no, well, well, both, but individual because uh, imagination is a is a human a human thing, and so um, my argument is that if we get together and and think about things in a different way, in a not simply in a rational way, not simply in a way that only involves money which is the only criterion that our leaders will apply to the arts, then we'll start to get somewhere. Because engaging with art, engaging with, with cultural expression, gives us a way to think in a different way, to imagine in a different way. It lets us look at the world through somebody else's eyes. You read a book, you see a play, you look at dance, you, you look at a painting, you've seen the world through somebody else's eyes, and it gives you... It helps to give you a different perspective on, on the way things are, and that makes you more open to things. And if we're more open, we're more ready to, to talk about what possibilities are, to imagine together. I mean, I, I would love to, to see um, our, our bureaucrats get involved with, with, with creative play. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a theater group, uh, several theater groups, but one in particular, uh, run by a man called David Diamond, where they, they do things called power plays, and they bring people together, all the stakeholders, everybody who's got any interest in, in the issue at all, and they, they ask them to act out what they're thinking, what their worries about are. You know, do you have a problem with your neighbor? Tell us about it, show us it. And they build plays together. And that process of making art together um, allows them to come to conclusions they might have not reached otherwise. It allows them to understand each other better, to realize that their neighbors aren't their, aren't their enemies. Um, it's, it's wonderfully productive in terms of, of opening up that side of your mind. It, 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 we're, we're obviously, you know, in, this, in the systems we live in, the, this economic process we, we, we go through to survive, um, we obviously put an emphasis on what we can prove, what we can bring evidence for. And so that, you know, you can't bring a lot of 
hard evidence for art. You can't measure the effect of art very well on a cost-benefit graph. Uh, although, I, I have to say, the arts community is working hard at doing that sort of thing. Um, but what you can do is recognize that there is a benefit of, of, of sharing our imaginations that goes beyond anything you can actually put a financial uh, measurement on, but it's certainly measurable in terms of benefit for society. Well, I, I know that there's been studies that show that um, well, even in, in elementary school and high school, uh, kids that take a music program, let's say, um, as well as all the academics, seem to, in the long run, do a lot better than ones who don't uh, get involved they, in, in music. They do. And it's, it's, um, there's more and more evidence coming out about this, the benefit of, of um, music and other, other arts in education in terms of, of developing the aspects of people that you don't get developed by the STEM curriculum. There's a big emphasis right now in education on STEM. Um, uh, that's you know the basic scientific side of things: science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. Great. Uh, I argue that we need to put an A in there and make it STEAM, STEAM. A for arts. Yes. Uh, because the art, the arts provide the that non-functional uh, aspect of of education, and it's just as important. As, as the um, as the as the technology. Now, I'm not saying I'm not by any means saying we don't need STEM. Of course, we do, but we also need um, the aspects of this education that make us think better, make us become more empathetic with each other, make us understand each other more, make us more confident in terms of, in terms of self-expression. All these things that come with and engaging with, with music and dance and painting and books. and It's a never-ending process of growth, and it's wonderful to watch. And we are eliminating that in our school systems. Frankly, Dennis, um, I, I've been saying this. The first column I wrote for the Vancouver Sun back in 1968 was about how we are shortchanging our young people in terms of their futures by not giving them exposure to the ways, the means for self-growth that are built into and into engaging with, with art, um, the way that it makes them think better, think more deeply, reflect more, see other points of view, all the things you need to succeed as, a, as an individual in this, in this society. We're shortchanging them on that. We, we, we give them all the tools to function in a in a um, scientific world, a science-based world, we teach them coding, which is important. We need that. But we also need to do something about how they use that coding, how they become engaged with other people, how they see ways to solve problems that go beyond the economic. And there's a part in your book where you talk about uh, classes now being held in, at places such as Capilano University for music therapy for Alzheimer's patients, for example. Yeah, indeed. Um, they, they're wonderful. This is this is provable stuff, which is what which is what's marvelous about it. Um, there's been so many uh, programs where they found that by bringing music and and and, and theater and uh, into um, into health, the health system, not just old people's homes, but into hospitals, um, it has a materially better effect on people's well-being. Uh, they they become more open, more uh, they become happier. They they, they think better. They, they it, it has really beneficial effects on on uh, patients and also on the doctors and the nurses that um, that that look after people. They they they've been providing um, art therapy for doctors and nurses as a way to. Uh, alleviate the strain and the stress and it's all working it, it makes it gives people a, a more a, a happier way to approach life a more less stressed way to approach life it engages a different part of the brain there's a guy called um mcgilchrist a, a, a psychiatrist ian mcgilchrist he's he's done a book about the divided brain and he says that much of this dislocation we uh, we have in society these days this discontent we feel with each other can be explained by the notion that the rational functions of the brain, the aspects that are controlled by the left side of the brain, have been allowed to crowd out the intuitive, the, the, 
the the um, the right side so that we prioritize economic growth, which is necessary, over human fulfillment, which certainly is necessary. I mean, all you, all you have to do is look around. I mean, yes, we have a, a, a very successful economic society for a large number of people, but there's also a, a large number of people who are not benefiting from that. We need to be able to spread the wealth, and, and I believe that through placing the imagination at uh, the heart of the way we work together, at the heart of our education systems as well, is a way to, to bring that balance back. I mean, McGilchrist says that to overcome that obsession we have with unbridled growth, we have to, you know, you know what it's like, we have to grow. If, it, if there isn't a growth in our GDP, yep. then we're in trouble. Right. Um, he, uh, he says that to overcome that obsession with that and clear the way for a more equitable world, which is all about individual well-being, individual potential. Um, we have to rebalance our brains. We have to give the right hemisphere, which deals with the intuitive, with creativity, um, more of a, more of a room to to play, to play. Well, speaking about the the money side of it, uh, in in broad terms, um, for years uh, Saskatchewan had a, a film tax credit, for want of a better term, and. So there was yeah. television shows were being made here, Corner Gas, a little a mosque on the yeah. prairie, things like that. And then uh, being a, a smart-ass uh, conservative-type government, they said, oh, no, there's no economic benefit to this, so they canceled it all. Hundreds, if yeah. not thousands, of people left the province because they couldn't get work in their chosen fields here. And those are good-paying jobs, and it's hard work. Well, you know, you've been on a film set, so have I. Those jobs, they work for 16, 18 hours a day, and uh, it's just as hard as working in the oil fields. But no, no, it didn't look like it was benefiting the economy all that much. Well, now they they brought it back now with the under a different term so now there's more productions and more economic growth with people being hired in their own communities and they're you know renting local facilities and they're using local suppliers (laughs) it just didn't make any sense to me why they even cancelled it in the first place you're absolutely right Dennis it it makes no sense they're shooting themselves in the foot when they do that because um, the economic benefit is phenomenal I mean yes there's a direct economic benefit of all those jobs you're just talking about but there's a spin off too I mean there's so many other workers the, 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 the craft service people the people who provide the, the hotels they, there's more than enough benefit um, more than enough tax revenue from all these things from, from the arts in general to cover government investment and make the whole idea of culture as a fringe activity irrelevant it's a non-starter the cultural activities create more work um, that have a greater impact uh, on Canada than agriculture and forestry and fishing and food service. Eight times more cultural impact than sport, despite the fact that, you know, payment for artists is far, far behind most other workers in Canada. It doesn't balance out. We're not, we're not treating one of our most valuable resources with anything like the the common sense and, and respect it deserves. And you talk in the book, uh, The Compassionate Imagination, about the new Canadian cultural contract. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, that's, that's really what I was just getting at just yep. now. Um, I believe that we need to reframe our approach to, to culture in general. We have to say, uh, okay, folks, um, this is the, this is what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to one. We're going to bring the arts back to the centre of the public agenda. That means that we're going to allow artists. We're going to invite artists um, to be part of the government decision making process. They're not outsiders. They're not people who sit on the edge and and um, entertain us. They're not the juggler with his with his with his cap in his hand. They're people who are contributing in serious solid ways to the way we think. They're bringing in that right brain approach to um, to the way we we make our decisions. So one of those contractors, those points of contract, is that we will allow artists, we will invite, invite artists to be at the table. Um, two, we will change our education systems. And I know it's all, all controlled by, by the education um, ministries in different provinces, they each have their own fiefdoms, but we need to 
persuade all of them to see the absolute importance of the arts and the humanities as uh, a contributor to the development of the truly um, prepared human being. Educate means to bring out, from the Latin, a duca, to lead out. Uh, we're trying to bring out the best individual we can and just teaching them the STEM stuff. It's fine, it's necessary, but we have to stay, teach them, we have to give them the humanities, the only, those, those aspects of life that are not covered by um, by STEM, but which are so necessary to a functioning human individual. So that's the second element. Um, the third element of this new social contract is to make the arts available to everyone. One of the biggest, actually, you know, Canada is, is really, we're really hostage to our geography, aren't we? We can't get around too well. Yeah. Um, the National Arts Center has never been a National Arts Center. It can't be. Because how many Canadians outside Ontario have been to the National Arts Center? Not very many, yeah. um, com comparatively. So we need to find new ways to get, let people have access to the arts in general. That means not just to, to, to the Arts Center, but um, to be, give them access to entertaining themselves, to to going to shows, yes, but also to making art themselves. I'm proposing a, a, a credit. Every hu every human being in Canada gets a, say, let's say $1,000 a year credit that they can spend on anything they like to do with creativity. It can be by buying tickets for the, for, the, for the theater. It can be buying tickets for a show. It can be buying um, craft materials. It can be do anything at all that gets involved with with creative activity, um, passive or active, doesn't matter. That's that will help access. And I'm also I'm also pushing for a national streaming service which will build be built entirely on Canadian productivity, um, Canadian theatre, Canadian dance, Canadian music, um, and, and every sort, every sort. And there'll be a 24-hour day free access streaming service that every Canadian can get hold of so that you will get you will get the benefit of the money you spend on the arts uh, every Canadian will get that benefit and it will be available to everyone and you will also get this benefit of a thousand bucks a year that you can spend you and your kids get one each um, to spend on anything you like to do with with um, with creative activity and the fourth thing and this is important yep and it's it's part of part of what has to do with the way we're trying to find reconciliation and reconciliation and, and redress with with our indigenous uh, neighbors they we will build indigenous ways of thinking and knowing into our our decision making processes there's a very um very different way of making decisions that we find in in indigenous peoples around the world and, and in canada too um and a way of expressing uh, their creativity creativity as well they are part of us and they need to be built into the system. Um, we build that way of knowing, those ways of thinking, into the way we make decisions. It'll change the world, it'll change Canada, it will make us a more uh, harmonious, a happier, a, a more balanced, a, a more democratic, a fairer country, and, and, a, and a happier one, more inclusive, more humane, more compassionate. That's what I'm going for. And we do now. Need we do need more humanity in our human life. That's the uh, compassionate imagination. And I want every Canadian to buy a copy and uh, live by the, dic not dictums, but ideas put forward. Max Wyman, thank you very much. But one more question before we go. What was it like being on the X-Files? It was wonderful. I was, I had a, such a wonderful time. Um, I played a, it was one, one, one scene, um, it was a, well, one scene, it was it lasted, it took a day to tape it. <laughs> um, I, I was a, a, a Scandinavian philosopher who was trying to persuade uh, Mulder that aliens existed. And um, I had a great scene with, with Mulder and, oh, it was just so much fun. <laughs> it is fun. I was on a few film sets, like I say. In fact, William B. Davis was here doing a TV show that, didn't get past four episodes and and so i was a corpse and he was the uh, he was the 
sort of the coroner examining me. And my goodness, if I was a dead person, I would like to have him as a coroner because he was very generous. Yes, thank you, sir, for being with us here, and we'll take care of you. And he was like rubbing my hair and everything. And anyway, it went from there. Oh, but, well, that... It was, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful world to be in. After that, after X Files thing, I got involved in movies, and I did a, a couple of movies. Um, I played a Russian ballet master to Misha Barton when she was a kid, <laughs> and and uh, it was so much fun. It is fun. It's a great fun. Yeah. It's a uh, long hours, but uh, it's great. Oh, fun. I don't, I don't mind that. No. I was, I, I went into, into I, I, did, I did a, a show once as well, a play. I was a dancer, if you can imagine it, in a, in a. <laughs> I, a non dancer as it happened, it turned out to be. But I, I, I enjoyed it so much, I wanted to go on tour, you know, <laughs> right. give up my job. <laughs> well, we're just be, again, we have to talk just one more minute about the X Files. So, what were they, the crew and the cast, uh, the main characters, were they, they good to work with? or? They were wonderful. Um, somebody told um, uh, Mother uh, that I was the, it was my first, um, my first gig as an actor, <laughs> and he was so. Good. He called me over. He sat me down next to him. His chair said it had his name on it. Mine didn't, yeah. but that's all right. <laughs> you know, I can I can wait for that. <laughs> um, but we sat and talked, and um, oh, it was it was just uh, just f phenomenal. He was he was the you know everybody says how bratty he is, but he was just great, just great. Everybody was the crew were you know they're they're real professionals. They have to be making those shows, and they were just so welcoming and and helpful and. It was funny because we were filming it in a uh, filming this scene in a. It was a panel discussion oh. in a um, in the in the uh, Port Moody council chambers, and they'd hired oh I don't know a couple of hundred extras to be there as as the the audience for this crew. And, and during a break, one of the one of the crew came over to me and said, "Did they bring you up from Los Angeles for this?" <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? No, I, I work for the local paper. <laughs> it, it was fun. It's it was, fun. Dennis, it was, it, you know, there's so much, I, I, I don't, I've never, never considered this job, working in the arts as a job. It was, I got, I've been paid all my life for doing something I love, which is going to the theater and reading books and learning from, from dancers. Now, I know you're not a big dance fan, but I tell you, dance is, as far as I'm concerned, it's the, the most moving and the most communicative of all the art forms for me. It, movement never lies. That was what one of the old dance people said. One dancer, Doris Humphrey, because when we when when a dancer dances, it's a, it's the naked truth. Because the the body can't do anything else. It's it's visibly expressive. The body is who we are. It's the place where we live, and it speaks volumes to me about. The diversity of the world we live in, about the the variety of meanings we convey and the intentions we have. I mean, you see somebody, you see a ballerina fall into the arms of a cavalier in something like Sleeping Beauty, and boy, you get great reams of information about love and comfort, and and it's very moving. I find it very moving, um, and I'd like to take you to a ballet one day and show you what it's really like. Well, uh, maybe I will look at it through a different eye after this. <laughs> Max, Max Wyman, thank you very much. It's been informative and entertaining. So thank you very much for being with us. Dennis, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at Amazon.ca. Oh, 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 oh.